My name is Eric Edwards, and uh, I live in Brooklyn. I'm a I'm a um, uh, an original Brooklynite, and uh, uh, predominantly lived in Brooklyn for all of my life, except for two years sojourn in Atlanta. And um, my heritage is here, even though my uh, my parents are from the island of Barbados, but I was born in Brooklyn, and uh, and my roots are here. Uh, but as you can see around you. Um, uh, what surrounds me is my passion and love in life is my collection of African art, which I call artifacts. And the difference between the art and the artifacts is that the art encompasses and the beauty of Africa and its craftsmen over up to 2,000 years ago in Africa, which I, I have pieces that are over 2,000 years in my collection. But also, they are artifacts because they were utilized by the people for various reasons, whether for utilitarian items such as, as uh, accessories for daily life, for, uh, weapons, tools, uh, but also for uh, uh, religious purposes uh, for, um, as uh, reliquary pieces that were used in funerals and prayer or used by uh, Babalaos who, for the various religions uh, and uh, those people who, me who mediate between the living and the dead and to bring uh, comfort to the souls of those whose uh, ancestors have passed and have uh, risen to the, to the realm of worship of, uh, as um, uh, um, reliquary uh, priestly type figures, if you will, if we could put it. Uh, uh, like that. So I definitely, in, within my collection, uh, encompasses the 54 countries, or some will say 55 countries of Africa. Uh, I have pieces from every particular con country, uh, and I have pieces within the collection that come from very secret societies such as the Mende and the Temne of Sierra, Sierra Leone, uh, uh, which were woman societies that taught young girls how to become a woman and taught them the, uh, the various um, uh, uh, tools of life that would carry them through life, enabling them to become great mothers and wives and also uh, to be care the caregivers uh, so they can learn um, medicinal um, uh, um, care, uh, uh, herbology, uh, um, um, how to deal with the spirits and to uh, transcend uh, and mediate between uh, those ancestors that have passed and those that we are uh, uh, living now. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, um, Africa is a, is a country of secrets and we are people of the spoken word that we have present in our society today. Uh, but those people of the spoken word, how we passed our religion uh, and our uh, 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 principles, relig religious principles, and it's also uh, those uh, methods and principles of science and mathematics and sociology and ethics, um, uh, uh, and, and standards that we have lived by for thousands of years, they were passed through spoken word. Um, uh, and those people uh, 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 who did this over the, last, over the thousands of years, they were called griots. And it was their job. They were the, the, uh, the historians of society. And they, they had incredible memories. And their job was to pass the information from uh, grandfather to father to son and to grandson and so and likewise on the maternal side uh, 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 of, of the, uh, the the granddaughter and this is very important in, uh, in, in, in these societies there are many societies that are represented within my collection because as as I often tell people the artifacts are if you study and, and, and learn what they're about, not just co collect them 
for their obvious aesthetic three-dimensional beauty, but also to go a, a step deeper and to, and to understand and to study and why did the artisans create them? Uh, how were they utilized? What was their purpose? Uh, uh, what secrets can they tell us about our own history? Um, um, you, uh, you know, the, the stories that each one of these pieces that you see around me can tell are incredible. And you will find by studying those pieces, which I have, because along with my collection, I built a massive library, which is just as important as the collection itself, except itself because it tells the story of what these pieces represent. Um, and how, why, how and why they are so important to us as a people. Because how I got involved with this as a youngster through my father telling me stories about Africa and its importance and why I had to know it, even though from his point of view, uh, he told these stories to myself and my brother for the most part because he wanted to inoculate us against the uh, the racism he knew we would encounter in the New York City public school system. And he wanted us to know, and my mother wanted us to know, that we were no better than anyone else, but we certainly were no lesser than anyone else. And, and we, they wanted us to know that whatever we could put our minds to and, and, and to focus on, we could do, we could accomplish. And that just should be no fear in accomplishment and, and reaching for the stars and for excellence, which Africans very much stood for in, in any culture within Africa that you study. They stood for excellence in their societies and their courts and the royal courts and the artisans that created these pieces. They belonged to guilds and societies and took many years of study through apprenticeships and so on and so forth. And it was no different than what you saw within med medieval Europe that the best artisans when, uh, were uh, employed by the royal courts and the kings and so on and so forth to uh, create some of the most distinguished and beautiful pieces and those pieces became symbols of power. So I have pieces within my collection that are just that, that belong to kings from like Benin and so, which they are symbols of power and they stated uh, the importance of the, of the royal leader or king or chief of a particular village or kingdom. Um, so uh, when his particular minister entered a room or went to, as an emissary to visit another king or a chief, and when he took that symbol of power from a different kingdom uh, representing that particular king, that they knew, in fact, this was someone that they had to bow to and respect and to um, uh, converse with. Uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in diplomacy, if you will. Well, how a young person can feel empowered is by um, study. I would say what I would do, just in talking in general to young people, I would make the, the, the statement to them that by just studying at a cursory level uh, what these pieces represent and to understand why they were, crea were created and what powers, in fact, the pieces hold, because our ancestors instill certain powers within certain pieces. This is part of our belief in our culture for thousands of years. And the certain pieces are in here, but overwhelmingly, the pieces I have within my collection, they're protective pieces. So there were religious ceremonies that were done when many of these pieces were created whether for what we call initiation purposes or for funerary purposes or for healing purposes. They were instilled with certain powers and through various ceremonies those pieces, those pieces can uh, be awakened to protect you, uh, to keep harm from you, uh, and, uh, and also uh, to understand that the people that created these people's pieces had very uh, strict skill sets. And if you, one of the things you learn about studying African art, you'll, you'll pick up any piece and you could turn it upside down or look in the back of it. There are no signatures on these piece, pieces. This is very different from other art forms, particularly European art in the world, because 
These pieces were created for sacred reasons. For example, the Abeji figures, uh, they're, very, they're very sacred uh, pieces, uh, what we call the twin pairs, uh, which were created for the people of Nigeria, in particular the Yoruba tribe, which has the highest incidence of natural twin births in the world. And, uh, and their belief system is that twins share a common soul, so there's one soul. So if a twin becomes sick or if a twin passes away, they create these what we call Abeji dolls. I have a very large collection of these, these dolls, antique dolls. And these dolls were given to the mother one at a time to, to, to incorporate the soul of the deceased twin. And the, that particular mother would take care of that doll as if that twin was still alive. And that would help nourish the living, the soul of the living twin. Um, and they're highly coveted and, and collected all over uh, the world. So the, the point is that what, it, what, what this collection will do, and Oh, and a very important thing I should add is that if you look through certain things within the collection, like I point out sometimes the young people, if you look at simple things like the sandals from the different peoples of Africa, uh, from north to south, east to west, whether they're from Egypt or if they're from the Sudan, if you look at the combs, whether they're from Namibia, um, or if you look at the, uh, the funerary rites and how the rituals and how the dead are taken care of and, 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 and nurtured or embalmed or, or buried and the rites that take place throughout Africa from Egypt uh, to uh, South America uh, or to uh, um, uh, uh, Ghana. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, matter. Sierra Leone. You'll find out there are certain things that are taking place within the continent of Africa, north to south, east to west, they are the same. So these are from people who migrated through Africa, who emanated from various different tribes uh, uh, or peoples and through various migrations, the, the Bantu migrations uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, that their customs and their basic traditions and how they do things are the same. And, 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 you, and if you study these people even deeper and you find out their contributions to the world and mankind in, 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 in physics and in sociology and mathematics and science and medicine and herbology, uh, all big pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, like Pfizer and, and so forth uh, in this country and the remedies that they have, have, have packaged and marketed for billions uh, if not trillions of dollars you'll find out that so many of those medicines came from herbs that the Africans and the Babalawas and the religious men and the healers were using in Africa for thousands of years and they were discovered and packaged in the West. Uh, so you'll find out that our, our contribution to the world in various disciplines, if you study the history, going back from the different kingdoms and the migrations and, 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 and the peoples of, uh, of Africa, you'll find out that our contributions came much earlier by a magnitude of thousands of years before they were ever discovered in the West or the East. Uh, and those stories can be learned amazingly through the study of the artifacts and going back to their creations in the peoples and the kingdoms, many of which don't exist today, such as the Nock Kingdom of this piece that is sitting on the side uh, to the left of me that's been carbon dated, thermoluminescence te tested for over 2,000 years that came from a, a kingdom in northern Nigeria. Uh, uh, and you'll find by studying these pieces, you'll see the similarities from the, the northern kingdoms of Africa, like Egypt, and uh, uh, and if you look, and if you look at uh, like in uh, various doors, like I have doors downstairs that uh, 
are carved very intricately and uh, that are very old. And these doors tell stories through the carvings. And they're very similar to the hieroglyphs that, we've see, that we see in England or, um, uh, or, from, um, or, or, or from other kingdoms in uh, uh, Africa, such as uh, uh, from Carthage and uh, where Hannibal came from. Um, that this, there are so many similarities that you clearly see through the study that these are one people, even though through uh, Africa's entanglement in, the, in the, 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 the 19th century going forward, primarily with the West, and the incursion into Africa for the riches that Africa contains, uh, how the kingdoms, uh, well, through the Berlin Con Conference of uh, like 1897, Africa was carved up across racial and ethnic lines, and how the people of common tongues were separated, not by happenstance, but on purpose, so they could, uh, so they could disunite the people of Africa and so they can divide, so to conquer and divide the spoils. And we are suffering from those divisions today that took place in Africa by the European powers, including the United States, who was part of the Berlin Conference that divided uh, Africa. But, um, but I would tell young people to study Africa as I have and to read, and the books are out there. You just have to discover them or have someone point you to them. And you, by studying these pieces is what I, how I started, and it took me to, to my past. I was a person who was in search of self. I wanted to know who I was. I felt that there was something missing. I knew I came from a great past thanks to what my father had taught me, but I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about us. I wanted to know what we contributed to the world. Why? I didn't want anybody to tell me we were great. We were great. I wanted to know, in fact, we were great and why we were great and what we did. And what my passion is right now based upon this collection uh, is that this collection tells the story of we as a people and what we contributed to the world. And our, our people and predominantly our young people have to know this because what the study of Africa and its history did for me prior to even studying the collection which just further reinforced and empowered me was to know who I was and why I could excel and how I could excel. And the reason I can do that is because we came from social systems and, uh, and value systems that taught excellence, that taught the brotherhood of man, that taught us that we had to protect our families, and how taught us how important our mothers and our sisters were, and how they were the pinnacle of life's creation itself. And, and that, that, that there was a balance of power and even though men, for the most part, ruled Africa, there were many great women. There were women kings. There were women warriors. There were women that certainly to be idolized. That's why we see the black women today as being such a powerful figure, because it goes back into our history. So uh, this collection tells all of those stories. And it's just so important for me to try to hold this collection together and not to break it up and to put it in a place where it can be utilized as a teaching tool to teach our, ch our children their past and to tell them who they are and to tell them of what they have contributed to the world. Uh, because that will empower them like nothing else will. And I know that for a fact because of certain t children that I've taken on the, my wing and taught just for a short while, and I saw a huge transformation that it made in them. And that was no surprise to me because that had already happened to me at a young age. And it enabled me to excel throughout uh, my school career. It enabled me to be valed valedictorian at junior high school. It enabled me to graduate at the top of my class at Brooklyn Technical High School. In Brooklyn Technical High School, downtown Brooklyn, my name is in bronze in the Hall of Honors. So I never feared combat with another pupil of any uh, ethnic uh, origin 
uh, in my travels through school. I was always in competition with myself and the ancestors, ancestors because I knew what they did and most importantly, I knew what they expected of me. Our ancestors expect us to do our best every day. They expect us to protect our family and the people in the village around us. They expect us to excel. And that's what we have to do. And that's what this collection will do. And it must be housed within a housing and, and, and under the jurisdiction of people of color to protect and to educate people of color. It's so important. And no one is gonna do this for us. One of the things that I know for sure is that within the New York City public school system, even though we have so many educators uh, of, of color and some not of color, uh, who would love to teach us our history, but they will never be allowed to teach us fully our history within the New York City public school system because you cannot do that without certain people negating, negating the, the, the history that they've already taught. My collection has to be used, besides its aesthetic, obvious aesthetic beauty and power that it has and three-dimensional qualities to it and historical uh, um, vestiges, it has to be used as an educational tool, tool primarily for us uh, for our people and our children who desperately need it to know uh, what their origins are, what their contributions are, even at an aesthetic sense of how they can create beauty uh, and how they have and their ancestors have created beauty, but to go far beyond the realm of beauty itself into the purposes of why these pieces were created and the power that they hold as far as the secrets and the stories of the ancestors. And another reason, as, a, as an educational tool, not only for us and our children, but, but, but also as a people of, of the African diaspora, but also for people of other origins and ethnic groups uh, and ethnicities within the, the country and the world. Because many people don't know our story, not only the, the many of us, of, of people of color don't know our story, but people of the other groups don't know it as well. And I think it's so important for everyone to learn what the true story is uh, and our contributions never to neg negate contributions of other groups and equal status that they have in the world. But we cannot, and the world cannot, deny us our status of importance and in contribution to the world. And that's what's taken place over the last six centuries. So that has to change. And it'll be an educational process for everyone. And I firmly believe at the end, it will make for a much more, uh, a much better and, and, compo and composite world uh, and a, a mutual, based upon mutual respect for all of us. Because we cannot progress as a people and we cannot progress in harmony with other groups unless we have the mutual respect and the respect that we do. Well, I come from a world of collectors and I've competed with various collectors at various auction houses and, uh, and galleries for, uh, for purchase and, and so off around the world and for private collections. And I've found that there are all types of people that collect African art, and in many cases, artifacts. And many of the people collect the, the, the pieces just for their aesthetic beauty and their intrigue and the power that you could see in the physical forms of certain of the pieces and this power that the particular artisan who made it who's unknown, instilled through his craftsmanship in those pieces. But those people, many of them collect out of a sheer uh, um, vantage point uh, or perspective of ignorance. They know nothing about the piece itself. They know nothing about the history of the piece, nor do they care to know. And many people of different ethnic groups collect pieces as, as a symbol of power to, unto themselves because collecting some of the most important and expensive pieces of African art in the world for some people is also a statement of power that they hold over African people. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, 
in general, those who own your artifacts and your, and, your, and your greatest art pieces that were collected by your ancestors, when they own those, they in fact think they own you as well. And when you don't take the time as a people, of people of African descent, to learn the importance of your own heritage and what your ancestors created and instilled within these pieces that they created, and you let them go into, uh, into other hands, then you will not do respect, because it's so important that you know your history and where you come from. So the only way that we can sort of level the playing field, so, and what I'm really saying is that we cannot point to other groups and blame them for everything. A lot of the, the problems that we and the burdens that we carry as a people are due to our own lack of due, del due diligence in taking our hands and putting it around and trying to understand and reach out to grab our own history and our own story. Because if you don't know your story, how can you expect anyone to respect you and your story if you don't know it yourself? And what's worse, if other people know your story and realize you don't, number one, they will never respect you. And number two, they will never share your story with you if they think you don't know it. I can tell you for a fact that many people of other cultures and ethnic groups that have visited and seen my collection, which I'm very restrictive, obviously, to who comes and sees my collection uh, because it's not open to the public. Um, those people that have come here have literally, in a very, very respectful way, sort of bowed to me because, and they look at me with different eyes because they know this is one man, a black man, a man of color who knows who he is. It's obvious when they walk in and they understand and I'm treated with a certain amount of reverence which I respect and I return to them because I believe in people that no matter who they are, where they come from, if they treat you with respect and reverence, it's your obligation to return that respect and reverence. And that's the basis in life that I travel and I think that we all should. There, I, I know for a fact, I mean, I hate to say this, but I, I, but I firmly believe in speaking the truth as I see it, is that there are many people who collect African art, and I've met many of them in various galleries and auction houses that are sheer racists. And sometimes when I get in discussions with those type of people, um, and, I, and, we, and I start telling them about certain pieces. I give them no idea the magnitude of my collection, but I tell them certain pieces I, I have. They look at me as a man of color and they don't believe me. They, don't, they wonder, they don't see, how could you possibly own that? Well, it can't be right. It can't be real, you know, because they don't think we are entitled to own our own culture and our own heritage and our own great pieces, which has been a lifelong quest of, of mine. And those particular type of people would certainly like a collection like this to vanish. And, 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 and I'm sure those type of people, if they had the wherewithal, would purchase it to make sure that happened. Well, what sparked the idea of collecting, like I said before, was my early education as a youngster, and I'm talking about the age of six, seven, or eight, by my father, whose name was James Edwards, um, about our, our culture and our history. He wanted to make sure that we, uh, his children, were empowered to know their history and where they came from and why they were just as important as anyone else in the world. And he did, and he did a great job in doing that. But what inspired me to go forward uh, with it, 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 my father was not a collector. He was just a study of history. Uh, and what f inspired me to go forward into the collecting side, because of that, those embers that were burned in me as a youngster, I always had this love of myself. Never um, conceited love. I never loved myself that much, but I had this respect of myself, but not only for myself, but my, my, my friends, my peers, uh, my schoolmates. I had this, this, this respect that just glowed more and more because I loved myself and I loved them 
because I knew who they were, even though many of them didn't know who they were. You know, and I knew I knew who we were as a people. And that love never died in me, even though I went on a path of technology. I became a network designer for AT&T. And, um, uh, and I traveled all around the world in business and so forth, you know. And, I, uh, and I'm a workaholic by nature, so I, you know, I put a lot of hours in, and I love working hard, I love excelling, I love being, striving for the best that I could be. And, uh, but that, that love of Africa, whenever I came back, there was always, when I was gone and when I came back, I always had that love of Africa inside of me. And then I, I, st I, I in the early, very early 70s, I started purchasing pieces in galleries and uh, in, in auctions and so on and so forth and uh, it just never stopped it just got greater and greater and as I purchased I also studied I bought the books to learn about if I didn't know about the piece I bought in detail I bought the books that covered that subject matter those people those ethnicities that tribe that kingdom whatever and I studied it and I found out the true importance of that piece, why it was created. And plus something I did over the years that's very important. I became friends with many, many Africans. And, and, and I learned uh, many secrets that they don't put in books from the different peoples and what their grandfathers taught them through, as I mentioned before, the griot system. That knowledge that was handed down from grandfather to father to son and grandson. So I put it all together and so I have this knowledge uh, that my sister wants to make sure doesn't die with me. That still exists to this day. If I, if I go for example to Sotheby's and there's 500 or 1,000 people in the room uh, at an auction, there's usually no more than two or three, four people of color in the whole room. We, and that's really, uh, it, make, it hurts when I see it. I mean, I should be used to it now, but it hurts uh, because we as a people economically have advanced a long way as far as our buying power. And I don't I need to give a dissertation on the buying power of African Americans and people of African descent in the United States, but we don't put any of our money within our culture and our history and to buy our artifacts. One of the things that drove me to buy African art, besides the sheer love of it, there's something that grabs me about it, I always felt by every piece that I purchased, I was purchasing a part of my past and my history back. I was, I was purchasing a, a part of me back. I was putting me, the pieces back together. So I always felt like I won a battle in a war when I would win a piece at an at a auction. Um, and, um, uh, and there are certain pieces within my collection that others have tried to pur purchase from me and offered quite some, some substantial sums of money that I turned down because I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't give those pieces back if I, what I went through to get them and there are certain significant ones that I can point out, that I can give you stories on that are quite, quite interesting to say the least. Um, but I always felt I was buying part of my history back, and I still do to this day. It's another piece of our culture and our history that I, that I buy back. And I try to tell people that they need to get in, involved with African culture and art. I try to tell people every African American and people from the African diaspora should own a piece of African art. It doesn't have to be a, a collectible piece of art. It doesn't have to be expensive, you know, but they should own a piece of art. And the only thing that I tell them is that they should make it a point when they buy a piece of art, African art, even if it's from a street vendor in the street, learn, know what country it came from, know what people it represents and know why it was created. Uh, what was its purpose? Even if it's a replica, it doesn't matter. They should know that because when they learn that and they can answer those three questions, they're learning something about themselves. You know, and of course those people of means that have 
uh, much more substantial funds to buy Ferraris and Jaguars and so, so on and so forth. Yet you'll go in their homes and there's not a piece of African culture and art. I just think that's terrible. I, I, I think that's hor a, hor a horrified statement that so many of us make. And I pray one day that it changes. Oh, Gil Noble, <laughs> one of my icons and people that I deeply revere and deeply miss. Uh, thanks to Dr. Adelaide Sanford, the revered Dr. Adelaide Sanford, um, who I've known for many years and consulted with for many years, um, she introduced me to Gil Noble. She told me that Gil was a person I had to meet and she knew, she was one of Gil's closest confidants. And she said Bill ha Gil also had to meet me. So a meeting was arranged uh, after I had actually um, gotten to go know Gil Noble for a, per a period of a year and a half. And this is also due to Dr. Adelaide Sanford. Um, at the time, his wife was ill and he was spending most of his spare time going to take care of her. But I would speak to Gil probably about once or twice a week. And it was amazing. I had his private number and I would call, whenever I would call him, he was one of those amazing people that would always pick up the phone and speak to you if you had that number. And, I, and typically whenever I spoke to him, most of the conversations were at least an hour. And I used to wonder how he had time to do his show if he spoke to other people as long as he spoke to me, you know. And we got to know each other very closely over a period of a year and a half. And so it got to the point where um, Dr. Sanford would not take no from an answer from him. She said, Eric, he has... And now, all of this took place. We discussed history, Africa artifacts, uh, a lot of things about him that were personal that were never on his TV show. And I used to tell him that, you know, Gil, you need to be interviewed yourself. Because I said, for some of the stories you told me, man, it, it would make one heck of a, of a broadcast. You know, he would laugh, you know. But anyway, Dr. Sanford, she sort of put up the pressure on him. She said, I'm not taking no for answer. You have to get over and see Eric's collection. So finally, he came on a Saturday. He came on a Saturday morning and he was amazed over my collection. And he took me downstairs. He spent the whole day with me. And my sister was here, my brother and some other, Dr. Sanford was here. Um, and he took me downstairs and we were downstairs talking together while the other people were upstairs. And he said to me, he looked me dead in the eye and he said, man, you did it. And I looked at him, a little perplexed, then he said it again. He said, man, you did, you did it. And I said, Gil, what did I do? He said, you did it. He said, you put this together. He said, Eric, it's incredible. He said, he said, you know, he said, he looked me dead in the eye and he said, you know, you're going to be famous. And I told Gil, I looked at him dead in the eye, and I said, Gil, I don't want to be famous. I said, I just want my life's work and my collection to educate our people and our children, because they need it more than I do. You know, I said, I don't need the fame, you know. Um, and he said, um, he said, I'm going to start working with you at a different level from this day forward. So we came back upstairs, we all sat at the table. Dr. Betty Dotson was here as well. Um, and he said, he told Adelaide, with all of us at the table, he said, I want to have a meeting here every other Saturday. He said, we have to start moving together. And he told, he told me and Adelaide, or Adelaide and I, that he wanted to buy, combine his archives with my collection in an institution. 
and in a, a, a museum or educational uh, research center. And you see, this had culminated from many conversations Gil and I had over the phone over a period of time because he, get, he, he discussed with me in detail where he did not want his archives to go. You know, I don't want to say too much about that, but he told me where his, he did not want his archives to go. And since I knew technology, I knew how to, I, I understood distributive uh, computing and uh, data centers and storage and all that kind of stuff and how da data could be accessed and distributed. Um, you know, we discussed various scenarios and topologies, how his goals could be accomplished without moving his collections to certain places that were being suggested to him by other people, you know. And he came upstairs and he told everyone he wanted to have a meeting here every other week uh, to discuss how he could combine the, 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 his historical film archives with my collection in one center. And it was kind of funny because Adelaide looked at him, she said, she said, Gil, we can't have a meeting every other week. We have to make sure we have an agenda and we have something to accomplish, to accomplish every other week, you know. So, uh, so that following week, not the following week, we had that meeting on a Saturday. That Monday he called me from ABC Studios and he told me that he wanted me to come in the following Wednesday. He said, Eric, are you ready? And I said, well, ready for what? He said, I want you to come in. He said, we don't have any time to waste. I want to start filming. He said, I want to start um, interviewing you on the show, you know, in your, in your collection and about your collection, you know. And then Dr., I mean, uh, Adelaide subsequently spoke to me and she said, Gil wants to do three episodes on you, you know. So I told Gil, I said, Gil, you know, I could come in on Wednesday and we can do that. But I said, I said, I thank you very much uh, for the invite. And I know, and it's very precious to me because of my esteem that I hold for you. I said, but I feel I only have one shot at this. And I said, if I come on your show, I want it to be very powerful. I said, I want to be able to reach every youth that's out there and, and reach them and make them see how important it is to learn what we already know. And I said, I would like if we do the first episode, I said, I would like to bring Adelaide with me to have her on my right. And I said on my left, I would like to have Ralph Carter, who's a dear friend of mine. You know, Ralph Carter, who played Michael on Good Times. We're very close friends. And I don't know how many people know it, but right, Ralph is very astute in African history. Me and him have had wondrous conversations. He's very well read and knowledgeable on African culture and history. Uh, and, um, and in fact, Ralph is very important to me because it's through Ralph that I met Adelaide San Sanford many years ago. And we became very, very close friends ever since. And so Gil told me, he said, okay, Eric. So we made preparations for me to go in the following Wednesday. At, uh, I was supposed to be there at um, one o'clock at ABC Studios. So Gil, so I spoke to him on the Friday before and like late in the afternoon, like around 3.30 or something like that. And he told me, he said, okay, Eric, you know, you're scheduled to come in here. And uh, he said, I'm looking forward to seeing you. We're gonna get this thing started. And he said, the last words he said to me were, he said, but Eric, make sure you call Wednesday morning. Cause he said, you never know what can happen. He said, make sure you call. So anyway, Wednesday morning I called like about 10 o'clock. He didn't pick up his phone. You know, and um, that was odd to me. So I shrugged it off. I said, I'll wait like an hour and try again. I called again. He didn't pick up his phone. You know, then I called at 1130. He didn't pick up his phone. And I didn't want to think anything negative. So I went to the subway and proceeded to Manhattan. 
And when I got there, and I asked for Gil, I said I was there to, to, to go to Gil's office, they told me he hadn't come in. Then I called uh, his office, and I asked for the, the executive producer, her name is Tracy Bagley. And she answered the phone, and I told her, you know, I'm supposed to uh, meet with Gil today. And uh, she told me Gil took ill over the weekend, and he would not be in. And of course, I asked her, was it anything serious? I hope it was nothing serious, and this and that. And I don't think she really knew or had all the information, so she said, no, she doesn't know, so we're hoping he'll be back in soon. So, and you know the story from there, what happened. So, the... Um, the three episodes that we were going to do never took place. Uh, historically, to my knowledge, I was the last person scheduled to be interviewed on his show. And uh, it was devastating to me, not because I couldn't do the interview, certainly, but I had built such a friendship up with this man who was one of my idols along with Paul Robeson. You know, um, and Malcolm X, and Marcus Garvey, Dr. Henry Clark, but he was certainly near the top of the list that for him to have a stroke like that, and the, the, uh, which I still felt he had so much to contribute even though we all know how much he did contribute. It was just devastating to me. And there hasn't been many things in my life that knocked me for a loop, but that one did. Because in the words that he spoke to me, last was that, well, Eric, make sure you call in the morning because you never know what can happen. And after he said it, we both laughed, you know. And of course, something did happen. And we lost one of the most iconic figures in our culture when we lost Gil Noble. Uh, so I, I still uh, feel something when I talk about him. I never think about this too much, to tell you the truth, because I'm a person that, uh, I live in the moment, but I see far into the future at the same time. I'm, I have sort of like a duplex person, personality and a duplex uh, scope, and I never take anything for granted, uh, but, uh, you know, so I never think in terms really of what people should remember me by, by, but I guess if I have to answer that question, I would say it's my contribution to our people. Because remember me by the contribution to myself as far as enriching myself with the, the love of our culture and its importance and to know that we are important, just as important as anyone else. And we've given this world so much that we haven't been given credit for. And my contribution is to make that story known if I can possibly do it. And I only can do it with the help of others. That's my contribution. So my contribution can never be singular. It only can be communal as far as the help I get from others to make our story known and our contributions to the world. Because I know that's truly the only way we can lift our children up and enable them to reach the potential that they certainly can reach. What's up to the children? You are the future leaders. You are the future standard bearers. You have to learn. You have to excel. Dig deep into yourself. Find out what your heart's motivation is. Experiment with different and noble things. Try different things. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure is okay because you learn from failure. You learn how to pick you up and then you find out what your talents are. By all means, What's up to you? Find out who you are. Because when you find out who you are, you will excel at whatever you choose to follow in life.